And the next speaker comes all the way from Rome. He lives there and he is a software engineer who's thirsty of interest about all science matter. He's addicted to different programming languages and he also uses all types of low level to high level programming languages and he's interested in optimization, operating systems, distributed systems, stuff like that. Most of, the, most of that I don't understand, but I'm sure he does really well. And his name is Andrea Giuliano, so applauses for his session today. Thank you, thank you. So, good morning. Today we are, we're gonna talk about asynchronous data processing. So, how you can process data messages asynchronously. Yeah, it doesn't work, okay. So, I'm Andrea Giuliano, I live in Italy. I'm from Italy and I live in Rome. I work for the Madbox and I'm a member of the PHP user group in Rome. We have plenty of open source projects on GitHub, so if you want to collaborate, any collaboration is appreciated. You can find me on uh, Twitter with the bit underscore shark username. So let's get it started. Everything is based on communication. Humans interactions, applications interactions, object interactions as well are all based on communication, if you think about it. So communication plays a primary role on systems. We can classify communication in two main models, synchronous communication and asynchronous communication. In synchronous communication, we have a system, let's say the system A, that sends a request to another system, let's say the system B. The system B takes the, the request, do the job it has to do, and when it finishes, it returns our response back to the system A. In the meantime, the system A remains locked. So synchronous communication reflects the request response model in which a client initiates a request, a request waiting for the response. A straightforward example of synchronous communication is a telephone call. You can only communicate with the other party if the other party is available at the time you place the call. Synchronous, uh, synchronous communications are easy to reason about because you have a plain workflow and you get an immediate feedback from other system and you know if something went wrong or not. On the contrary, clients can get stuck waiting for a response and this is impractical when you need low latency. In asynchronous communication, we have a system, the system A, that at a certain point in time sends a request to a system B and it continues to do the work it has to do. The system B, on the other hand, takes care of the request and do the task in background, so asynchronously. Asynchronous communication fits very well the event-based mode of communication. Instead of a client initiate a request asking for a system to do something, it instead says, something has happened and expect that other parties know what to do. Voice mail is an example of asynchronous communication. You leave a message so that the receiver can listen to it later. Asynchronous communications are useful for long-running jobs. Suppose that you have to handle images, you can demand image resizing, cropping an image to a background task. When used in event-based mode, you can decouple your system because you have different parties of your system that communicate indirectly. And for this reason, you can scale well your system because you scale all, only the part of your system that you need to scale. For example, your, uh, your image system. On the contrary, you may need to, to add libraries and general system requirements, so software uh, in, onto your system. So communication takes the form of messages. 
Messages are an abstraction layer across technologies. They have an intrinsic meaning. Through messages, systems with different technologies can communicate among themselves, only knowing the meaning of the message. This is valid both for synchronous and asynchronous communication. You can think about a REST API, and if you want to create a resource, you send a request with a body and the post verb, and you are saying to the other system that you want to create a resource, the, the post verb, with certain properties. So, for achieving interoperability, we need the messaging a messaging middleware that creates full interoperability between conforming clients. So we have to introduce a standard both of the networking protocol and on the server-side services. The advanced message queuing protocol is an open standard for passing business uh, messages between systems. The payload of the message is simply some sort of data structure. It can be interpreted simply as data as the description of, of a command to be invoked on the receiver, or as the description of an event that occurred in the sender. Some famous broker that implements the uh, uh, IMQP is are uh, Azure Service Bus, ActiveMQ, and RabbitMQ. So, IMQP is implemented from entities that are called brokers. Messaging brokers receive messages from publisher that are applications that publish messages, also known as producers, and send messages to consumers that are applications that want to consume messages. In between, a messaging broker can store, buffer, or persist a message according to the rule that you give it. Since AMQP is a networking protocol, the producer, the consumer, and the broker can all reside on different networks. So let's take a look at what's inside a broker. The first entity involved is called the exchange. The exchange is in charge of taking a message and based on its policy, append the message to one or more than one queue, broadcast the message, or do advanced routing. The type of the exchange will define the policy it will use to dispatch messages through consumers. Exchanges then distribute messages copies using rules that, that are called bindings. And in the end, me, uh, messages are stored inside a queue. You can see a queue as an infinite buffer. You can store as many messages as you want. At this point, messaging bro brokers either deliver messages to consumers subscribed to the queue, or consumers fetch messages from the queue on demand. OK. We saw how, a bro how broker work, and we want to understand how can we pass messages between systems. So we have to introduce messaging pattern. In order to do so, we need a messaging middleware, a messaging broker, and RabbitMQ is an open source messaging broker that implements the uh, IMQP standard. There is a library written by Vidal Alvaro, and uh, uh, you can install it through Composer. So have you ever heard about RabbitMQ? OK. So the first part that we're going to see is called producer-consumer. That involves, obviously, two components, a producer and a consumer. The producer's job is to produce messages and send them to, to the broker. At this point, messages are stored inside a queue. And the consumer, on the other hand, consumes messages from the queue that is interested into. This pattern, if you notice, is as simple as powerful because it has all the desirable feature we want. We have two separate entities, the producer and the consumer. They, they are talked indirectly through the, the messaging broker 
And you can build the consumer with PHP and the producer with Java. So we have interoperability between systems that can talk asynchronously and you can scale consumers or producer, but it's meaningless. Okay, so we want to produce messages. Before producing messages, let me explain the domain we are working on. Suppose that you have a system in which a million of users are, inter are interested into the weekly newsletter. So you have to send a million of emails every week. You can approach the problem simply by pushing a, a button and wait for the system for sending a million of emails, or you can encapsulate the, the necessary information in a message send a message to a queue and let the consumer consume messages in an asynchronous way. So we want to, 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 to take this kind of approach. The first thing we have to do is to open a connection. The IMQP stream connection abstract the socket connection. We are connecting to a machine that resides on the same host as the, the producer, but obviously we can connect to a remote messaging broker. From the connection, we get the channel. And the channel is the abstract, pi the abstract pipe in which you invoke all the API for consuming, producing messages to do advanced stuff. The next step is to declare a queue in which we want to send, we want to push messages. Our queue is named weekly newsletter. And the last step is to produce messages. So we say into the channel that we want to publish a message in the weekly newsletter queue. But, but before doing so, we ask the system for getting the user subscribed to the newsletter. And for each user, we create a custom data structure, in this case, an array. We encapsulate this information in an AMQP message in the form of a JSON and we simply push the message to the weekly newsletter queue. So we have the weekly newsletter queue that contains a million of messages that contains information about the, the, the user, such as the name and email. On the other hand, we have the consumer. The consumer is interested into taking messages and send emails to all the million of your users. So, the first step is to, to, to declare uh, a connection to get the channel. If you notice, we are declaring a, a, a queue named weekly newsletter. So we are declaring the queue named the weekly newsletter both in the producer and in the consumer because queue declaration is idempotent. It will only create, it will create it only once but declaring a queue both in the producer and in the, in the consumer, you can start the producer and then the consumer or vice versa, and you are completely sure that the queue exists. The next step is to consume messages. So we say that in the channel that we want to consume messages in the weekly newsletter queue, and for each message we want to apply a callback. Our callback is a simple function is the code, the, uh, the body of the message from a JSON to an array, and we use a mail factory to send a weekly newsletter email to, to the user with a certain name and a specific email. It's worth notice that if you start the consumer, the consumer take, takes the queue, receives the messages in the queue, and after it finishes, it simply quits. We don't want to do so. We want that the consumer remains alive, waiting for new messages in the channel. And in order to do so, we have to say into the channel that we want to wait for new messages. The producer-consumer pattern is very powerful. You can scale on consumer simply starting new consumers. In this way, your messaging broker will dispatch messages among all the consumers, so you can distribute the load among consumers. But it can happen that consumers die. What if a, co a consumer dies? 
Since the messaging broker deletes the message after sending the message to the consumer, if the consumer dies before processing the message, you simply lost the message. So, in order to support consumer dying, we have to introduce a new concept that is named message acknowledgement. Message acknowledgement is a, a simple form of message, it's a light message that the consumer sent to the broker in order to say to the broker, hey broker, I finished it with this message, you can safely remove the message from the queue. Switching our message acknowledgement is very simple. You, you say in the channel when you, when you want to consume messages from the weekly newsletter queue, you say that in the channel, we, uh, uh, we, will send mess, uh, we will send acknowledgement, switching off the fourth parameter. It's strange, but you have to switch off the fourth parameter, not on. And when we finish to process the message, so after we send the weekly newsletter to the user contained in the message, we have to get the channel from the message and we say in the channel that we want to send an acknowledgement to the broker sending the delivery target the message. In this way, we are telling to the broker, to RabbitMQ, that, uh, hey, RabbitMQ, I sent the email. You can remove the message with the delivery tag 42, for example. Forgetting to send acknowledgement is a common mistake, but the consequences are very serious. The, the uh, RabbitMQ, a messaging broker, won't delete all the unact messages. So if you forget to send acknowledgement, the, the messaging broker will delete more and more memory. And when you start new consumers, all the old messages will be dispatched to the new consumers. So don't forget to send acknowledgement. Maybe you are wondering which policy the messaging broker will use when you start new consumers. RabbitMQ uses the round-robin dispatching policy. Who's familiar with round-robin policy? Wow, good. The round-robin policy is a very simple policy. It's a straightforward policy. It consists to send the next message to the next consumer. Okay, so the first message to the first consumer, the second to the second, the third to the first, the fourth to the second, and so on. But for certain instances of the queue, when we have all the odd messages that are heavy tasks and all the even messages that are light tasks, it can happen that the first message is sent to the first consumer, and it's okay because the first consumer is free, while the first consumer is Processing the heavy task, the second task that is a light task is sent to the second consumer, and it's okay. But now, because of the round robin dispatching, the third message is sent to the first consumer. So the first consumer is still busy, and we are sending a new heavy task to the first consumer, and the second consumer could be free. So this is a situation in which the first consumer will be overloaded most of the time, and the second consumer will be free most of the time. And we don't want to do so. We want a fair dispatching. We want a policy in which we say to the, to, to the broker, hey, I'm a consumer, I'm free, you can safely send me a, a new message. So we want that for this instance of the queue, the first heavy task is sent to the first consumer, it's okay because it's free, the second one to the second consumer, and it's okay. But now, since the second consumer finishes to process the message before the, the first consumer that is still busy, we send an acknowledgement from the consumer to the broker, and the broker knows that we are free, and, we, and it can simply send the, second, the third heavy task to the second consumer. In this way, we are distributing the load, and we have a fair dispatching through the uh, the consumers. Enabling a fair dispatching is very simple. You only have to say to the channel that you want a basic QoS 
with a prefetch count of one. So you are saying to RabbitMQ not to send more than one message to a single consumer. So RabbitMQ, in other words, will wait for an acknowledgement from the, the consumer, and when they receive the acknowledgement, it will send the message to that consumer. Cool, isn't it? But it can happen there. Even the broker can die. What if a broker dies? If you have your plenty of queue full of millions of messages and your system crashes because of Windows, I'm joking. <laughs> if the broker dies, you lose, you lose all the messages the broker holds. So how can you afford this kind of situation? In order to support broker death, we have to mark the message as durable. So we have to introduce durability. We want to say that each message have, has to be persist on, file, on the file system and, uh, and the channel has to be durable. Even durability is very simple in RabbitMQ with the, the Alvaro Vida, uh, with the Vidal Alvaro library. And you can declare a queue, uh, persistent switching the third, the third parameter to true. And when you create a new message, you, you encode the, 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 the data in a JSON format, but you pass as an option the delivery mode to two. That simply means persist the message and fail system. So when the broker die now, when you restart it again, it simply fetch messages from the file system and continues to do the, the job it has to do. So this is the first very simple pattern. We saw that in the producer consumer, we sent different messages to different consumers. We can scale up on consumers and so on. But we want to do with the publish subscribe pattern a completely different thing. We want that a subset of processes, a subset, a subset of scripts, if you, if you see it so, receives the same copy of the message they are interested into. So, in short, we want a publisher that creates messages and send them to, to the messaging broker, to RabbitMQ. The uh, RabbitMQ is aware of a set of subscribers that are interested into that kind of, uh, of message. And the, the messaging broker simply send multiple copies of the same message to different consumers, in this case, subscribers. So previously, do you remember the exchange the exchange and the messaging broker, previous slide, okay. Previously, we didn't see the role played by the exchange with the publish subscriber pattern, it comes into play. The first thing again is to explain our domain. Supposing we have a microservice architecture, who's familiar with the microservice architectures? Okay, a microservice architecture is an architecture in which you have Different microservice, and each microservice is a single responsibility, and they are decoupled by definition, and they can talk with each other. So messaging broker fits very well this type of environment. So we have this microservice architecture in which we have a mail service that was single responsibility is to send emails. An authentication service was single responsibility is to handle authentication, and a coupon service was single responsibility is to handle coupon, create coupon, and so on. So all the three services want to know when a user is created. So they tell to the broker, hey broker, tell me when a, a new user is created. There is no magic here, we have a user service, that is a, a microservice that was single responsibility is to handle user life cycle. So you create, update, and delete users from the user service. 
when a new user is created, the user service encapsulate some information about the user in a user-created object and send this information in the form of a message to the broker. At this point, the broker knows that it has to send this message to the mail service because we want to send a welcome email to the user, to the authentication service because we want to create an access token for the user, and a coupon service because we want to create a, a discount for new users. So the first thing we have to do is, again, publish messages. So we, again, create a connection, get the channel, blah, blah, blah. And now we don't declare a queue, we declare an exchange. So the first difference is, is here. We are declaring an exchange named user, where step is print out. Do you remember the, the exchange type will define the policy used by the exchange? Okay, the fan out type simply means broadcast the message to all the consumers subscribed to, to, to the exchange. So when the bro messaging broker receives a new message, in the, uh, when the user exchange will receive new messages, it, it simply dispatch the messages to all the subscribers subscribed to, to it, okay? So again, we create a, a, a user-created event in the form of a, an object, and we encapsulate this object as a JSON in an AMQP message. And in the end, we publish the message not to the queue, but we, we pass it to the, the, the user exchange, okay? So we don't see the queue, but we see only the exchange. At this point, we want to subscribe to user-created events, and in order to do so, we have to declare the exchange. Again, exchange declaration is impotent. You, it will create it only once. You can declare both in the publisher and in the subscribers. And now, we want to declare also a queue. And we're creating a queue with an empty name. What does it mean? It means that simply Rabbit and Queue will create a randomly named queue for us, and we grasp the name in the queue underscore name variable. In this, in, in this way, we can bind the queue to the user exchange. So we have a situation in which we have the publisher, we have the exchange, the publishers send messages to the user exchange. We have subscribers, each one with its queue, and each queue of the subscriber is binded to the user exchange. So, we want to consume messages. And we say again that we want, uh, we say to the channel that we want to consume messages from the queue applying for each message a callback as previously, and for each message we decode the, the body of the message and send uh, uh, an email. And we wait for new messages. But we want to do a little more. We have an exchange named user. You send user creation in the user exchange, and this is not so good. We want a situation in which we can mark messages with a particular written key, and we send the marked message to the exchange, and all the subscribers can subscribe to the exchange with a particular routing key. This policy is called routing. So, Beatles routing. For example, suppose that the mail service is interested in two uh, messages containing user uh, message uh, events, the user created the user updated event because he wants to send a welcome email when a user is created and he wants to say, hey, I updated your profile when my user is updated. Whereas the other two services, the alpha and coupon service, want to listen to only the user created event. How can we do so? We can create two exchanges, but it's very ugly. Or we can use the routine policy. So, we declare an exchange and we 
change the type of the exchange from fan out, that means simply broadcast the message, to direct. The direct type simply means broadcast the message, but only to those subscribers that have subscribed to a message marked with a particular routing key. So we create a message, an AMQP message, and we publish the message to the user exchange, marking the message as updated. So we are saying user updated. We have uh, subscribers, that, uh, the main service is our subscriber that want to listen to event, uh, messages marked with the created and updated routine key. So we declare the exchange of type direct, again in the, in the subscriber, and then for we, uh, we, we get the, the, the name of the queue and for each event, so for the created and updated routing key, we bind the queue to those routing key. So we have a queue, a randomly named generated queue. We have the user exchange, and we are saying to the user exchange that, that we are interested into only mes the messages marked as created and updated, whilst routing key is exactly created and updated. Do you like it? But we want more. What if we want to handle items? Oh God, we have to declare a new exchange because the previous exchange was named user. We have to declare a new exchange named item, a new exchange named coupon, a new exchange whatever. So we don't want to do so. We want to do advanced stuff. We want that our subscriber have the ability of subscribe to a matching routing. So we want to use a, a, a policy similar to a regular expression with routing keys. And this policy is called topic. So we want to subscribe to particular topics. When we enable the topic function to the exchange, the routing key has to be a dot delimited word. And we have two special characters, the star and the dash. The star simply means one word of your choice. The dash simply means how many words you want of your choice. So we are saying here that the mail service want to listen to messages marked as user dot whatever and the authentication service want to listen to messages marked as user.created, and the coupon service want to listen to messages marked as user.created and whatever.purchased. It's very simple. It's similar to the previous example. We have to switch the type from direct to topic, and now our routing key is a dot delimited routing key Rapid and Q know what, uh, what it has to do, and we bind the queue as previously to the My System Exchange, a general name, uh, with the routing key user.created and star.purchased. So let's do an example. The user service creates a message and marks the message as user.created. We have the mail service, the out service, and coupon service with those routing keys. So, since user.star matches user.created and user.created matches user.created, obviously, the message is simply broadcasted to all the three services. What about user.updated? User.updated doesn't match user.created, user doesn't match user.updated, but user.star, star means whatever, one word, matches, star matches updated. So this kind of message is sent to only to the first service, only to the mail service. And what about item.purchased? Well, item.purchased doesn't match user.whatever, doesn't match user.created, but matches whatever a word 
that purchased. So the message is sent only to the coupon service. So now you have enough scale. Item dot created. What about item dot created? User dot star doesn't match use item dot created. User dot created doesn't match item dot created. Star dot purchase doesn't match item dot created. Wow. The message is simply thrown away. So we are reaching the end. We saw synchronous, asynchronous communication. We saw how can we use messages for passing business, business uh, concept between system. And we, uh, we saw it with, through the, the publish subscribe pattern and the producer consumer pattern. We can do very advanced stuff. And the concept here is that don't do the things you don't have to do in a synchro in synchronous way. If you have to handle images, if you have to, to I don't know, to do some task light or heavy, but you can, if you can demand a task to a background process, do it. Because your application, in this way, your application can become faster. With messages, you can abstract part of your system. You can build a microservice architecture or your ecosystem that is, the, that is um, composed by different parts, all the couple from the others. And in this way, you naturally gain interoperability. If the mail service doesn't need a data store, you simply don't install a data store on the mail service. If the user service needs MySQL and PHP, you simply use PHP and MySQL only in the user service. And if the coupon service need, needs uh, MongoDB and Java, you can use MongoDB and Java in the coupon service. Again, don't forget that we can scale part of our system. If you need more resources of, of image handling, you can scale only that part of the system. If you need more, uh, more resources on the authentication service, you can scale only the authentication service, and so on. So, Messages are very powerful. You can do whatever you want and in different ways, and you can obtain something back, such as scalability, system decoupled, interoperability, and so on. So that's all, Fox. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you. Please read the talk on joined in so we can improve next time. If you have any question, Hi. Hi. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you. I have a it's question a pleasure. though. Uh, is there any kind of control channel or some, some kind of control info for uh, RabbitMQ size? So we can uh, set some process to do some kind of uh, load balancing or something like there that. There are different approaches to that problem. You can use software such as New Relic. Do you know New Relic? It's a, a monitoring service that you can install on your, uh, on your system, but it's commercial. You can build your own daemon that check if the, the broker is alive. There is a, a manager, uh, RabbitMQ has a manager. You can see some information, such as if you can't access to the manager, the, the broker is died. <laughs> yeah, there, there are different approaches. You, can, you have to handle that in, in a, with separate software. Okay, thank you. But it's possible. You have to do that because you, you need to know if the broker is still alive or not. So. I uh, would like to know how does it work from a technical point of view? Is the consumer running forever 
or is it triggered from the message queue? Okay. Every consumer is a process. As its own li life, the broker is a process as its own life. The messaging broker send messages to leave uh, leave process uh, leave processes leave consumers leave subscribers. So yeah, everything uh, every, is not uh, they aren't. Yeah, yeah, you have to 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 start your consumer and your subscriber in order to. To do to to passing messages between publishers and the producers, uh, subscribers and consumers. So yeah, you you can uh, you you can do so because when messages passes through the broker, the broker simply see if there is everyone that that is listening to that message to that specific queue or with that specific routing key. So it has to be alive. Uh, how will you do help no transactions? Good one. What do you mean for transactions? Atomicity. What? Atomicity. Yeah, but the da database is transaction or transaction the between systems? User, yes, between systems. Okay. Tricky one. You can use a key value database handling transaction between systems. You can use a, no, a, a custom acknowledgement. In this way, you, you can produce a message, a task. Your consumer do the task, and when you finish, other than acknowledge the, the broker, you can acknowledge the system that calls you. In this way, when you finish, well, for example, if you have to handle uh, 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 the, the resize of a, an image, you send a message, the, the image service can resize the image, and when it, finish, uh, when it finishes, it, it, can broca it can send a message back to, to the producer, or it can set some flags on the database. I don't recommend this way, but it is possible. So you can let Think communicates among themselves. A producer can be a consumer and vice versa. For the consumer and the producer. Yeah, it's tricky. But you can let things communicate between among themselves. So in this way, when when you finish to to handle the image, the the, the other service, the, your website, know that the image is ready and you can and you can let the, the, the user see the image question to the first one. How do you usually scale the broker? Can you scale it horizontally or not? Okay. You can scale the broker, but it's a very tough choice. You have to be careful because do you really need to scale the broker? Because when, when you send message, the broker simply take a message and send a message. You, so you, you don't need, you don't really need to, to scale the broker. But if you want, you can do so, but you have, you have to add a, a, a layer uh, at the, uh, yeah, before the, the brokers, before the, the broker's replica, and you have to, to do a, a load balancer policy. Yeah. So you can do so. Any other questions? Uh, one guys? more here. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, so many questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, Where? Hello. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm interested in. Uh, uh, so we have uh, asynchronous communication in case when we have long, uh, uh, long running tasks. Yeah. So uh, if this task is uh, consists of several subtasks, how can producer knows on which stage of the producing the uh, the task? Uh, the current worker is, for example. Okay. You can decompose messages, producers, consumers. So if you send a message, I, I recommend to send small messages, okay? But if you send a, a big message, your consumer can divide the message in sub-messages and become a producer for other consumers. 
So you can decouple the message, divide the message into many messages, and send part of the message to other systems. You can approach the problem this way. My question was um, that uh, it, it was a, a small message, but um, the task is long, and uh, um, you have subtasks, even the, the message is small. How yeah. the, the producer can know on which stage in the processing? That the producer know. doesn't know what happens under the, under the hood. So the producer only know to build a message and send a message. It doesn't care if there, are one, there is one consumer, plenty of consumer, if you have to, uh, uh, to, to, to do subtask in order to uh, finish your job, whatever. It, it simply wants to, to, to produce a message and send a message to, to the broker. Stop. On the other hand, you have the consumer, and you can optimize the consumers, the consumer over the consumers, in order to uh, to to perform well. But you can, you can't. It's your it's your choice. So you can start, you can fork processes, you can do whatever you want, since the the, the communication is asynchronous. So you you care only. When you, you, uh, you send a message, you start the functionality, and you need maybe a mechanism for returning some information back or not, and you can set the flag on the database. Again, you can resend a message back or whatever you want, but you can take even a week. It's a, perform a performance problem. So you, you need to, to, to scale your consumer maybe with processes in your system. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you.